If you ask the internet for a list of topics that preachers avoid preaching on, uh, you will get a list that's almost certainly um, US-centric, um, but it will include things like same-sex marriage, uh, politics, and money. Um, back in October, November time, I think it was, we were in, uh, the trustees were in a trustees meeting, we were discussing the budget for 2024, and we were talking about the situation in terms of giving to the church, and I thought that it would be a good idea to take one of these first Sundays in the month, which, although they're no longer at 4 p.m., they are still off topic, to take one of these first Sundays in the month um, and to explore the theme of God and money. It's a topic that we don't talk about uh, very often, but it is relevant to all of us. And what I want to do today is just have a look at some of the biblical principles um, and allow those to help us as we think about this topic of God and money. It's good that our young people are in, uh, because as I say, this is a topic that is relevant for all of us. I know that some of you um, have started to get part-time jobs, uh, and so you've started to get some, some money. Uh, and when you go shopping, you, you look at something and you think, how many hours am I going to have to work in order to afford that? Um, and I think that when it comes to developing good habits or when it comes to developing a godly way of thinking and a godly attitude towards money, the earlier we start getting into good habits, the better. It's a lot easier to start getting it right from the beginning than to try and alter course after years and years of doing things differently. We're not going to focus on a particular passage that, or the passage that we just read. We're going to hop around um, various parts of the Bible, picking out some key themes and highlighting some principles. But right at the beginning, I want to reassure you of something, but also challenge you as well. I want to reassure you that I am not going to tell you what to do with your money. Um, each of us is in a very different context. Uh, we have different amounts of money coming in. We have different sized families. Uh, we are at different stages of life. Some of us will have children that are dependent on, a, on us. Some of us may have older relatives who are dependent on us. Um, some of us won't have enough coming in to meet our needs. Others of us may have more than enough to meet our needs. Some of us will be in debt. Some of us won't be. Uh, and so I'm not going to tell you what to do with your money. But I do want to challenge each of us that in the light of the principles that we're going to look at this morning, I want to challenge us to go away and to prayerfully consider what God is saying to each of us in terms of our finances. And if this is something that you've never thought about, or it's something that you've not thought about in a long time, then God will almost certainly have something he wants to say to you. But what God says to you is going to be different to what God is going to say to the person sat in front of you or behind you. Um, if you're married to the person who sat next to you, then depending on what you think it is that God is saying to you, you might want to confirm it with them before you do anything. Um, because some of the decisions that you might want to make regarding your finances and, what you, and your possessions will be decisions that you need to take jointly and not um, on your own. At the beginning of the service, uh, we started with some words from Psalm 50. Uh, where God is talking about the offerings that the people are making. And the problem is that their hearts were in the wrong place. And God points out that he doesn't need our offerings. Everything in all of creation belongs to him anyway. And so our starting point is that everything in the whole of creation already belongs to God. And therefore, everything that I have already belongs to God. 
We are stewards of God's resources. And they, therefore, God is interested in what I do with everything that I have. And therefore, when it comes to my possessions, the stuff that I have, as well as the stuff that I have given away, God is interested in. And when it comes to the stuff that I've kept for myself, I shouldn't think of that as mine. Everything that we have belongs to God. And so, for example, as a family, uh, we have been blessed on a number of occasions when our car has had to spend longer than anticipated in the garage, and we've needed a car to get around. We've been blessed as people in the church family have lent us their car for two or three days. Thinking of something that's not mine, but it's something that belongs to God and is to be used for God's glory. Uh, last March, we learnt these verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, which remind us that our giving should be something that we want to do. It should be something that we do cheerfully. It should not be something we do reluctantly or because we feel compelled to do or because we feel guilty or because we feel that we can twist God's arm or that if I just give this to God, he'll be happy and he'll just be off my case for a few more weeks. And so our giving should be cheerful and voluntary. Uh, and so if you go away this morning feeling or motivated to give out of guilt, or motivated to give because it's something that you feel you really should do, but you don't really want to, then please don't give. Um, those of you who are engaging with the Sermon on the Mount resources this year will see this again and again in Matthew's teachings in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, as well as in the Gospels as a whole. That if our outward actions are right but our inward attitudes and motives are wrong, then it doesn't count for anything as far as God is concerned. And there are plenty of examples in the Bible, Old and New Testament, of people doing the right thing on the outside, but their hearts and their attitudes are wrong. And God has all kinds of warnings for people in that situation. And so if you do leave here, um, thinking that you need to take a look at your finances but your heart is a bit reluctant and grudging, then pray and ask God to give you the right heart attitude. So next, uh, and these points aren't in any uh, particular order of importance. It's just as I tried to make sense of my ever-increasing length of notes, uh, this would seem to be a relatively sensible order. So giving to uh, help the poor and the needy is a response that you would expect to see from someone who was following Jesus. If you know the story of Ruth and Boaz uh, from the Old Testament, you will know that Ruth was in Boaz's field picking up leftover grain uh, Grain that the harvesters in Leviticus were commanded to leave for the benefit of the poor, those who would otherwise have no means of feeding themselves. And this is just one example of many examples um, in the Old Testament where God's people were commanded to care for the most vulnerable. When we move into the New Testament, we see uh, in Jesus what a compassionate God looks like. And that compassion continues into the early church. So in Acts chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 4, we see that at the very beginning as the church started, uh, those who had shared with those who did not have. And so all of the needs within the church family were met. Later on, uh, when the Jerusalem church was to start experiencing some real hardship, uh, Paul hears about it, and he encourages these new Gentile churches, churches in places like Corinth 
and in places like Galatia to make a collection and to send the money to help the suffering church in Jerusalem. And so if we are walking in step with the Spirit, if we are becoming more like Jesus, then we will want to use what we have to help those who don't have. Giving also counters a scarcity mindset. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, One of the major themes that runs from the Bible from the very beginning to the very end is this question of trusting God. Am I prepared to trust God? And I think our finances are one of the major areas in our lives where God invites us to trust him. And what we do with our finances and our attitude towards money and possessions reveals an awful lot about whether or not we trust God. A scarcity mindset says, I don't have enough, and therefore I need to keep what I have to myself. And in order to make sure I've got enough for tomorrow and for next week and for next month and for next year, I need to get more and I need to keep it to myself. It is the mindset of the foolish farmer um, in Luke chapter 12. He had an abundant harvest, he tore down his barns, and he built bigger barns so that he could store it all for himself, that he could have plenty in the years to come, so that he could come, he could take it easy, so that he could take early retirement, rather than give it all away and continue farming for the next few years. The problem with the foolish farmer was not his bigger barns. There's nothing in itself wrong with bigger barns. Um, In the Old Testament, that was Joseph's solution to the impending famine. Build bigger barns, store all the grain so that there would be enough in the years when there was no grain coming in. The problem was that this man in Jesus' parable was not rich towards God. Another way that Jesus puts this in the Sermon on the Mount is by telling his disciples to store up treasures in heaven and not treasures on earth. Because Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's also what he means when he talks about seeking first the kingdom of heaven. But what does this actually mean? look like? Well, as I hinted at earlier on, what it looks like will be different for each of us. And that includes with what we do, with what we keep, as well as what we do with what we give away. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with preparing for the future. There are things that you do need to save for. Maybe a child's university place or a pension But so much of this is to do with our attitude and where we place our trust and what we consider to be enough. I'm not going to be talking about percentages, uh, particularly the figure 10%, because I think some of the reason we like to talk about percentages is because it gets a lot of us off the hook. And it provides enough loopholes that means that we can tick the I'm giving to God box and it doesn't actually cost us too much. Some of you will be aware of the Old Testament principle of tithing. That legal requirement in the Old Testament that the people were to give 10% of the harvest of the land and of the livestock, it was to be dedicated to God, it was to be given to the Levites who had no inheritance and no land of their own. And no doubt, at some point, those of you that have been around church for a long time, you will have probably had a conversation, maybe in a home group, about tithing and about the practicalities of tithing, giving 10% of your income 
to God's work. Do you do it before tax or after tax? What about national insurance and pension contributions? Is it 10% before all of that's taken off or 10% after it's taken off? And often these discussions betray an attitude in which we are trying to get away with as little as possible. We want to do as little as possible, but still keep God happy. Uh, John Wesley was an Anglican priest. He was a Methodist. He was a theologian who taught at Oxford. He was an itinerant preacher, and he was an evangelist, and he lived in the 1700s. Um, earlier, early on in his career, um, there was an incident in which he wasn't able to help someone who didn't have enough warm clothes. He just simply wanted to get them a coat, but he couldn't get it because he spent all his own money on himself. And so he decided to limit his expenses so that he would have more to give away. So early on in his career, he was earning £30 a year. His expenses, he calculated at £28 a year. And so he had £2 to give away, 6.6%. The next year, his income doubled. But he still lived off £28, and therefore he had £32 to give away, which is 53%. The next year, his income jumped again to £90. The pattern continued this year, giving away 67%. And later on in his life, uh, even when his income rose to £1,400, he did allow his expenses to creep up, maybe because of inflation, to £30, but he gave away 1,370. And for those of you that do like percentages, that is 97.9% of his income. And Wesley preached that Christians should not tithe, but they should give away any extra income once the family and once the creditors have been taken care of. He believed that everything else should be given away. And that an increasing income should not increase a Christian's standard of living, but it should increase a Christian's standard of giving. And so this principle is not, well, how much should I give? The principle or the question should rather be, well, how much do I need to keep? Wesley took care of the essentials and then gave everything else away. And so whilst his income was low, he didn't have very much to give away. But as his income grew, he was able to give away more and more. Um, if you think, well, that's okay for the 1700s, but surely that's unrealistic uh, or unworkable or irrelevant in 2024, um, then go onto the Bible Project website, search for uh, under their podcasts for a podcast called Story, God, and Money. And there's a very interesting podcast interview there with a couple uh, of guys. Uh, guys who, they were earning a lot of money in their 20s. Um, they were Christians, and they could quite easily write a check for 10% and give it to the church, and they barely noticed the money going from their bank account. They had dreams to retire at 40, um, to own multi-million dollar uh, homes, to drive expensive cars, and just to keep on giving the 10% check to the church every week or every month. But they were challenged um, at Harvard Business School by the Holy Spirit to live a much simpler life and to give away a lot more. And that podcast is just a little bit of their story. Um, as I say, my notes for this just kept on growing. And every time I would work on a section, my notes would grow even longer. So I am aware of the time. That clock's slow. So that's even worse than I thought it was. Uh, now I'm totally aware of the time. Um, so uh, just a few bullet points. Some of these things may uh, or may not make it into home group uh, questions this week. So some of our giving should be 
to the local church. Uh, and we see that principle throughout the Bible. Um, if you've not got a Baptist background, you may not be aware of how Baptist churches are funded, but we support, we are totally uh, self-funding here. There's no central fund at Baptist House that comes our way every, every week or every month. And so everything that we do here is only possible through the generous donations of people like you. The most cost-effective way to give to the church is through direct debit or bank transfer. And uh, you can speak to Debbie um, at the back afterwards, and she'll be more than happy to pass on all the relevant details. Um, our giving should be sacrificial. Uh, there's a story in Mark chapter 12 where Jesus commends a woman who just puts in two small coins into the offering, but it was all that she had. And Jesus compares it to these large gifts that these very generous people are putting in. And Jesus says that she's given much more because she's given out of the little that she has. And they, as I say, hardly, hardly noticed it. They've given loads, but in terms of how much they have, it's, hard, it's hardly anything. Uh, research in America and also research in Manchester um, has shown that those in the poorest 20% in terms of percentage of income, give far more than those in the top 20% of income. So research shows that those towards the bottom end, those who have least in terms of percentage, often give a lot more than those that have a lot. Jesus warns us of the deceitfulness of wealth that can easily choke uh, choke us and, and stunt and stop and halt our growth as disciples. The writer of Proverbs says, give me neither poverty nor riches. Um, rattling through. Um, Philippians 4.13, one of the most misquoted and misused verses in the Bible, I think. Its context is one in which Paul is talking about learning to be content in any and every, every situation, whether he's got plenty or whether he is in need. Um, how do I know who to give to? Well, I'd encourage us to think about that question prayerfully. Um, I think we should be looking that our, what we give, our gifts should have an eternal impact so we should be looking to give to Christian organizations. Um, and I think it makes sense to give in line with those things that we're passionate and interested in. And so, for example, if you're passionate about sport, then why not support a Christian organization that's using sport to reach people with the gospel? Um, some of our giving, if not, if not all of our giving, giving, should be local so that the money doesn't just disappear off into the distance and we should be looking to use it where it has the greatest impact. Um, you might ask, well, should I be investing? Um, some people give their money away. Other people invest it and then use the resulting profits for God's kingdom. The question is, well, what is God saying to you? Should I live a more simple lifestyle and give more away? Again, I'm not going to tell you what God's saying to you, but the answer to that question is probably uh, for most of us, if not all of us. Um, what about my debts? Should I pay off my debts first? Again, I'm not going to give you a blanket answer, but almost certainly... Uh, that would be a wise course of action to take. And if you, um, if you are struggling in that area, then please do speak to someone and get some advice. Um, just to mention that we do have a fellowship fund um, here at the church, a fund that is there to help those in the church family who are going through financial difficulty, maybe an unexpected bill or something breaks, um, 
And if you want to access uh, that, then you just need to speak to either Debbie or myself. That was very quick. I am very, very conscious of that. So do you want to know more? Um, Fiona is over with the children, but some of you will know that Fiona works for Cam uh, money, the Money Advice Center in Cambridge. She's put a pile of these leaflets at the back, so these are free for you to take away. Um, conquering your money, some practical advice and some steps if you're struggling to get a handle on your finances, do take those. Uh, but if you would like to know more in terms of the practical stuff, then do speak to me or Fiona. I'm going to be speaking to Fiona afterwards. We will probably almost certainly look at putting something in the diary um, to look at some of the practical aspects of budgeting and money and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, so if you have specific questions that haven't been answered this morning, then do let us know. Right. I'm going to pray. And then I will leave you to go away and to prayerfully consider the things that I've talked about as well as the things that I've missed out and overlooked. Let's pray.